Luke chapter 3, verses 15 through 17, 21 through 22. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with the unquenchable fire. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when John had also been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying, You are my son, the beloved. And with you, I am well pleased. And this is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So today we celebrate the baptism of the Lord. And if you've been paying attention to the readings over the last few weeks, you'll notice that we've been jumping around a lot in time. When we last saw Jesus, he was a child being visited by the Magi, when he was John's light of the world, and then the word of God, and now he's a young man in his 30s with a beard, and he's being baptized by his cousin John the Baptist. And if you have children or grandchildren, you know that time can go that quickly sometimes. You look and throw a grown up. This was an exciting time for Jesus. Because Jesus is just at the very beginning of his ministry. He had not yet performed the miracles that we will read about later in the Gospels, but his baptism was the christening and the commissioning for his own life. So right after this passage, the text goes straight into his ministry. It says Jesus was about 30 years old when he started his ministry, and then boom, after naming a long laundry list of Jesus' ancestors, he finds himself inserted into the wilderness. And we'll get into that part more next week, but the point is, the dude didn't get a break. He was sent out in the world not to just live, laugh, love, but to resurrect the dead of heart and spirit, us. And during his lifetime, Jesus would show us the way to truly live, how to glorify God, how to treat others, and how to love and forgive ourselves. So after the death of Christ, Christians in the early church would baptize everyone who wanted to become a member of the church on Easter. It was a whole thing. Sometimes hundreds of people would be baptized all at once. There's actually an Orthodox Christian church in Rochester that still honors this tradition, and they do mass baptisms in Lake Ontario on Easter Day, yes, even when Easter falls on an icy cold day still clinging to winter. I have not seen it, but I have had friends who have gone to watch it, clergy friends, and I imagine there's lots of running to and fro in these ceremonies, running from a heated car to a beautiful long white robe into the lake and then out of the lake as quickly as possible into a beach towel and back into the heated car. And I pity the poor priest that has to stay out there in the water the whole time. I will not miss that. <laughs> so they do this much like the early church because of the grand symbolism of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the obvious connections to Easter Sunday. Baptists traditionally practice baptism by full immersion to symbolize the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. When you're dunked, that's the death and the burial part. You fall back and you're submerged into a watery grave. When you come back up out of the water, that's the resurrection piece. 
So other Christian traditions don't necessarily dunk, some sprinkle, others pour, but essentially the symbolism is meant to be the same, just a little less messy. It's not a requirement to be baptized on Easter anymore. We, we can do it whenever someone is adequately prepared. However, that same symbolism that was important to the early church is still relevant for us today. And I would say, especially today. We're living in a time of collective grief on a scale that many of us never imagined we'd see in our lifetime. We live in a world that seems like almost daily full of mass shootings, unchecked brutality against women and people of color, the devastation of climate change, the rising despair of the underinsured and underhoused, and a global pandemic on top of it all. A virus is separating us from our family, our friends, our loved ones, canceling our milestones and traditions and rites of passage, suffocating the young and the old alike, the healthy and the frail. We are reminded daily by increasing death tolls how fragile human life really is and how not one of us is guaranteed tomorrow. Some days it all feels so taxing. The news of more deaths and violence, the extra pandemic precautions, the stress over the issue of mandates, the exhaustion caused by prolonged sickness and complications, the loss of another friend, and the fear for our safety and the terror of the unknown. Maybe some of us are numb to it at this point, but even that goes to show that no human heart, no matter how well-intentioned, cultivated, or strong, was designed to experience this kind of collective grief and continue living as if nothing was happening. So for those of us who are not blessed with perfect lives, to experience personal grief on top of this collective sadness is the stuff of broken hearts and broken spirits sometimes. Life does go on and the challenges we experience keep coming, even in the midst of the shadow of death, and sometimes it can feel like we're being held underwater, like we're stuck in the death and the burial stage. And there's only one thing that can help bring us up out of the depths into resurrection, and that's hope, specifically, hope in the liberation that the baptism and the ministry of Jesus Christ reveals to us in the Gospels. We desire baptism or oneness with Christ because we want to become new people, better people in our faith, we desire to walk with God and to follow the teachings of Jesus. And there's a very important thing that we need to remember about baptism today. It's not about what we do, how we do it, or even what we say. It's not about a ceremony or a certificate or the way the water hits our body, whether we kneel or stand. Baptism is about what God does for us, all of us even those of us who haven't taken the plunge. In the passage from Isaiah today, it says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. This is God's promise that came to fruition in Jesus Christ, who is sent to walk alongside of us, to be one of us, to experience the same joys and hardships that we do. What God has done for us and Him is give us all we need. We need Jesus. Every day we need Jesus. We need to emulate His love, to truly love ourselves and our neighbors. We need to follow his example to stay on track and to give us the strength to face all of life's challenges. 
We need to practice the teachings of Jesus to fully care for the earth, for all of creation and each other. Most American Baptists do not believe that you must be baptized by full immersion or formally baptized at all in order to be, quote, saved or to know Jesus. One can make a profession of faith in other ways and still become a sanctified follower of Jesus. So in these cases, we may not need water, but we still need Jesus. And God chose the symbol of water, baptism, the forgiveness of sins, ultimately to symbolize Christ's love for us. Water is, if you think about it, an ordinary substance that has a very important function. We need it to survive. So just as water is vital to our existence, the love of Christ is something we need not only to live, but to thrive. And to accept that love, because sometimes it's really hard to accept that love and that grace. We need to come to Jesus and admit our faults, our shortcomings, what some might call our sins. But these are things that separate us from the love of God, from being able to love ourselves, from being able to truly love others. That means we have to baptize and become baptized daily by submitting ourselves to God, asking to be washed clean. And I can think of no better example how to live this out than by following the suggestions of the well-known prayer attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. So when we're living out a life of faith and mission, it's much harder to be drawn into too deep a kind of grief that does not serve us or help us heal, that keeps us feeling stagnated. We need to be able to extend the same love that comes to us in forgiveness and grace to others. We need to extend it to ourselves. Sometimes we need to do it over and over and over until we get it right, until we can experience that real joy and live the life of abundance that God desires for us without shame. Some days it's easier said than done. But we remember that God is our life-giving water working for us, constantly revealing to us the next step of our journey, the next part of our path to explore, the next opportunity to share the living water, the good news of gospel with the world. So child of God, would you believe me today if I told you at this very moment, God is reaching out to you in your grief, saying, you are my beloved child, and with you I am well pleased. Would you believe me if I told you that the wellspring of God's holy pleasure in you could never run dry? Well, it's true. It's the same source of water we hear about John 4, where Jesus says, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So, child of God, the spring of truth and life lies before you today and every day. 
and both greet grief and enjoy. Drink in the love of God and be transformed by the hope that God has in you. Come up from the depths and see the hand extended to you to bring you home. Whose hand? The hand of your neighbor. Go on, look at your neighbor's hand. My hand. Feast your eyes upon it. Your hand. Go on, look down at them. These are the hands and the feet that are the tools of the resurrection. We serve each other as Christ served us to lift one another up from grief and despair. We feed the hungry and we clothe the naked in his name. We protect the widow and the orphan and the foreigner in his name. We free the oppressed and heal the sick and visit those in prison in his name. We support decision-making in ways of life that bring hope and health to people, no matter their race, their gender, their economic class, their national origin, their sexual orientation, or physical ability. We bring joy and hope and light to the nation, not on our own, but through Christ Jesus, who leads the way in his example baptism and commission. So this is our mission. Should we choose to accept it, we can either stay with our heads under the water trying to convince ourselves that grief is all there is, or we can choose to follow Jesus on the surface of the water, even with all of its rocky, choppy waves, even with a path full of setbacks and maybe even death, we can trust in time that this is the road that ultimately leads to hope for the world, to the resurrection of ourselves and of creation. We can take it one step at a time, one breath at a time. That's all we can do. And thankfully, that's a speed perfectly acceptable to our Creator and our Divine Guide. And today, that feels like very good, much needed good news. And God's people said, <laughs>